ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States of America. If they have to pay out $159,000 billion lead, <laughs> less. This has been the President of the United States of America. May God have mercy on our souls. StuDoesMerch.com. Use the promo code Stu10. Save 10% right now. If you're watching on YouTube, like the video, take a time to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications, do all the things. We appreciate it. Matt Ridley is going to be here to tell us how his COVID lab leak views evolved over time into a, a fabulous, fabulous book that kind of told the story before the Department of Energy ever got around to it. Biden gets his veto pen ready for a bill passed by the Democrat-controlled Senate. But we start by doing the abortion distortion. Yes, it rhymes. Whenever you can get a rhyme out of abortion, it's we get, we, we, next time we're going to do the abortion contortion. And then I think we're out. So this is an important episode. Uh, let me start here with giving you a little bit of background on this one, because I got to be honest with you. I don't really watch reality TV. I don't I never got into it, really. Never really my thing. So I didn't really know the backstory here. You may. But just in case there are people out there like me who didn't really know who the Duggars were, let me just walk you through it. Uh, 19 Kids and Counting, apparently. Uh, they're a big show. They had 19 kids. And I guess maybe thinking about more, I guess the counting part would, would, would illustrate that. I've got, I, I said to my producer, can you give me just some like Duggar fun facts so I can explain uh, who they are to, to, for people who might not know? So I'm just going to go through them with you. This is who the Duggars are. Uh, they are a family of devout Baptists who shot to fame on 19 Kids and Counting on TLC. The show frequently discussed values of purity, modesty, and faith in God. That sounds good. They were all raised in a family home in Tonitown, Arkansas. The Duggars avoid birth control, saying they've decided to allow God to determine the number of children they have. All the children are homeschooled and access to entertainment, such as movies and television, are limited. They practice chaperoned courtship, in which a couple becomes acquainted only in a group setting. Jim Bob and Michelle head the Duggar family. Um, all 19 of their children have names that begin with the letter J. <laughs> then they're all listed. Should I go through all of them with you? Yes? Okay. All right. Here we go. Uh, Joshua, Jaina, John David, Jill, Jessa, Ginger with a J, which is, you're really reaching there. Okay. You're reaching on that one. Joseph, Josiah, Joy, Anna, Jedediah, Jeremiah, Jason, James, Justin, Jackson, Johanna, Jennifer, Jordan Grace and Josie. That's the 19. The Duggar family became famous when they were featured on TLC's uh, 19 Kids and Counting. It documented the lives of parents Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar and their 19 kids, nine girls, 10 boys. It ran from, uh, it ran from uh, 2008 till it was canceled in 2015. Now, again, I want to reiterate that I asked for fun facts about the Duggars. This is the last fun fact on the list. <laughs> On May 22, 2015, TLC suspended the series when the Duggars' eldest son, Josh, publicly apologizing, apologized for having acted inexcusably following reports that he molested five girls. That's not a fun fact. That's the opposite of a fun fact. That's a terrible fact. And I, it does lead me, though, to something that I thought of when we were having kids, which we, had, we have two kids, and they're awesome. I freaking love my kids. They're just the best. And, and I thought to myself... We kind of went two for two here. Time to stop pushing it. You know, like you have 19 kids. One of them's going to join ISIS. I mean, it's almost like guaranteed. Like something terrible is going to happen with one of them. One of them's going to run over a bunch of kids at a kindergarten playground. One of them's going to crash a, build a plane into a building. One, I mean, it's 19. You're just pushing it too far. You might get 17 great ones. One that's kind of mediocre. But one of them is going to be a serial killer. So I was like, let's just stop it, too. We, we're two for two. Why push it? If, if the third one sucks, then where are we? That's your parenting advice for the day. I hope you uh, enjoyed the, today's episode of Parent Corner with Stu. Um, Jessica, uh, Jessa Duggar is the mom. And the headlines are all over the place. I saw the headline. 
Apparently, she's very pro-life, but yet she had an abortion. Typical hypocrite Christian, right? This is what the storyline has always been. Jessica Duggard uh, had an abortion, even if she won't say the word. She's trying to hide her abortion, according to the media. And actually, the headline I saw was not that she had an abortion, but that she had a life-saving abortion. Oh, yes, the wonderful mythology of the life-saving abortion. And yet I saw that headline like everywhere. It was that Jessa Duggar reveals she had a life-saving abortion in emotional new video. And that headline was out there for a while. It's been corrected now, at least by some sources. Here's the side-by-side. -side. This is Parade. Jessa Duggar reveals she had a life-saving abortion in an emotional new video. That has now been changed to Jessa Duggar reveals she had a miscarriage in emotional new video. Well, which one was it? I mean, life-saving abortion. That's really, really important. And in fact, I want to draw your attention to this term. This term is an important term that you need to know and need to be looking for. The media is trying to pull one over your eyes right now, and they're trying to make sure you think this thing is a thing. And we're going to go through how it's not a thing. But I want to show you some examples of this because the left has decided that if they allow, if they, they allow the abortion argument to proceed on its logical lines, they're going to lose it. They're worried about losing it. They don't want to lose abortion. As you know, it's like a rite of passage. It is like uh, one of the most fundamental parts of the religion of leftism. And they can't lose it. So they will say literally anything to defend this practice of killing children. Now, look, life-saving abortion. You might say, okay, it's a really serious uh, condition. Um, you know, maybe you could think of this now. I mean, it's always been hard for me to understand the life-saving abortion thing. And there is a bit of a debate on what a life-saving abortion might be. Uh, the debate is, goes between these two things. Is it uh, incredibly rare and really, really unlikely that you'd ever have to have a life-saving abortion, but in very extreme circumstances, it might be medically necessary. And then the other side of the argument is, it's never necessary. It's not even a thing. You're never gonna need to have an abortion. You're not gonna have to kill the baby to remove it. The baby's gonna have to come out either way. You're never gonna have to do that. That's sort of the debate. We'll get back to that here in a second, but let me give you some of the fabulous people who have had life-saving abortions. Chrissy Teigen said that she realized she had a life-saving abortion with her third child and felt silly that it took her over a year to understand it wasn't a miscarriage. Now, look, uh, Chrissy Teigen is not a smart person. I think we've all, this has been established over a very long period of time. I understand it, you understand it, if you even know who she is. However, if you have an abortion, you typically are aware of it. There are, very, there are very few surprise party abortions. You don't walk in and just say, surprise, you just had an abortion. Really, really rare that that happens. You, you think that maybe, maybe you're being manipulated a little bit. Like if you have a miscarriage and then over a year people convince you it's a life-saving abortion, you don't see any, any red flags there at all? That maybe you're being manipulated by your idiotic liberal friends? Do you think? Apparently not. My abortion saved my life, says someone named Halsey, as she talks about Roe versus Wade and motherhood in a new essay. And you know what? Unfortunately, didn't get a chance to get to that essay, but I'm going to do it right after the show. And also uh, get some fun facts about who Halsey is. Jenny Molin. <laughs> I'm going to need some more fun facts. Reveals miscarriage during pandemic and says she's grateful for life-saving abortion care. Life-saving abortion care from Jenny Mullen, who is a person of note. And I want to make sure you know that and get some more fun facts on that one. And Laura Prepon. I need some more fast facts on that one as well. Or sorry, fun facts. Fun facts, like which one of her relatives committed some horrific capital crime? Can I get some fun facts? Like that. Okay, uh, Laura Prepon, uh, I think she is she from that 70s show? She looks kind of familiar. Having a life saving abortion at the time I had the choice. So, is life saving abortion a thing? Most experts will tell you no. The problem with life saving abortion is in an abortion, you're ending the life of the baby. So, right off the bat, every abortion is a life ending abortion. <laughs> 
Uh, it's, that's really, really important to understand. Every abortion is a life-ending abortion. So having it be a life-saving abortion, at the very least, you're breaking even, right? Like you're maybe saving one and ending another. Like that's not, it, maybe it's no worse than neutral, but it seems uh, like that's never the case. Now, of course, when you talk about what an abortion is, it's ending the life of the baby and then extracting the baby uh, from the mother. Now, the thing is, if you're going to extract the baby from the mother, you could just do it while it's alive. This is why a lot of people uh, and many, many doctors argue, look, health of the mother can be, it can be, there can be an increased risk of problems. There can be an increased risk as, you know, anytime you have a child, this is one of the dumb arguments they tried to bring to the Supreme Court. Well, if I was just st sitting here doing nothing, it would be uh, better than uh, having a baby because in theory, I could have a problem uh, through childbirth, so therefore, it's safe for me to not have one and therefore abortion should be legal. They try these arguments all the time and they're, they're real stretches. I mean, I think everybody recognizes that there are stretch arguments, but still, it's an argument that they, they often will make. And you could say, there can be certain circumstances where uh, health can be at risk, there can be uh, complications, uh, but again, those complications are likely to also occur if the baby uh, is dead and you're extracting it. Like it's just not, there's not a good argument for the life ending, you know? Even if you try, and even if it's hopeless, and you try and it doesn't, it doesn't work and the baby passes away, this happens to mothers sometimes. It's tragic for people to go through, but I will say it's also not exactly uh, similar at all to what they're talking about. What they're talking about here is a life-saving abortion. Now, the important thing to understand, this is the truth, and everyone who actually looks at the facts of this argument will agree. Even liberals, they all know this is true. They're lying to you intentionally to try to make life-saving abortion a thing. So when people try to ban abortion, you could say, well, what about life-saving abortions? They want to make this phrase stick out to you. They want to convert the process that Jessa Duggar went through into an abortion. They want to change the definition of it. They want you to think that is what we're talking about when we talk about an abortion, when they 100% know and understand it's not what we're talking about. National Review writes, Jessica Duggar Seewald had a miscarriage, not an abortion. And this is the key part here. What happened was she had a miscarriage. Multiple weeks later, they went to check on the child, realized the child had passed away. Then they removed the child from the womb. The left is trying to convince you that this is an abortion. It is not at all. No opponent of abortion would describe removing the dead fetus out of your uh, womb as an abortion. That is not what abortion is. Abortion consists of killing the child first, stopping the heartbeat, ending the life. That's the part we're all worried about. We prefer children to live. It's a weird stance. It's an extremist stance. People think we're crazy for wanting it, but we think kids alive equals good. I know that's not popular in the media. I understand how wild a theory that may seem to be to so many in America, but nobody thinks removing a miscarriage is an abortion, including Every single person on the left who says it, they all know they're lying. They all are doing this intentionally. They know this is not what we're talking about. John McCormick puts it really, really well when he says, saying that a miscarriage, it's saying that miscarriage care is the same as abortion is like saying that burying a dead child is the same as burying a child alive. The process is the same, but the moral acts could not be more different. Right. Burying a child alive and burying a child after it's passed away, much, much different. Yes, the process is similar. Kind of a different thing. One of them is a ceremony that has gone on for hundreds of years. One of them is murder. They all know what they're doing here. Now, of course, part of it 
is trying to shame Christians. Oh, look at these hypocrites. Of course, that's part of it. But the larger part here is trying to convert this process of removing a miscarriage into a life-saving abortion because they need to have some moral argument for what they're doing when they currently have none. Now, that's not the only thing the media and the left are lying about here. They're also lying about this. Jessa Duggar Seawalt's miscarriage treatment, this one they're admitting it was a miscarriage treatment, was a procedure many can't get after abortion bans. The same procedure used in a miscarriage or elective abortion can be life-saving. That's if people have the option to receive it in their state. I want to make sure you understand this in case you don't follow these things every day. There is absolutely no state in the union that has banned removing a miscarriage. There's not one example of this. Every single state allows for this to occur. Every single state allows for treatment for an ectopic pregnancy. And yet over and over and over again, the left keeps coming back to you and saying, well, we don't know. Who knows? Maybe the government will prosecute mothers for removing miscarriages. I, maybe the state is requiring uh, the, the, the deceased body of their potential offspring to remain inside of them forever. Maybe that's what they intended by the law. We don't know, shrug shoulders. They know. They know with 100% certainty. One way to know is to read the laws. And all of them have exceptions for this. And if you're worried about some language that doesn't spell it out clearly enough for you, another way to look at it is to ask the people who came up with the laws. And if you ask them, you know what they'll tell you? They'll tell you the truth, that there is no way anyone is going to get prosecuted for removing a miscarried fetus. That is not going to occur. It is not what the law is intended. If for some reason some crazy person took it that way, the law would be changed immediately, but it doesn't need to be changed immediately because obviously that's not what's going on here. It is disgraceful what they're trying to do. They're trying to terrify people who may have a miscarriage into voting for them. Oh my goodness, you had a miscarriage, you had, you remember when you had that removed? You know, now you'd go to prison for that. Did you know that? You should vote for me. Shouldn't I get your money for my campaign? Isn't that the next logical step here? Shouldn't you take the money that you could be using for your family or to go do something fun or to enjoy your life? Instead, shouldn't you give it to me for a 30 second ad so I can lie to more people? Wouldn't that be rational? The media is distorting uh, these abortions that are, you know, the typical ones we're talking about are ones, abortions made by choice, the pro-choice side of this. And they're trying to conflate those with medically necessary treatments that have nothing to do with abortion. No conservative has ever opposed these things. That's not what we're talking about. And they know that's not what we're talking about. They're lying to women and they're trying to scare them. They keep saying, well, we don't know what, we don't know of these conservatives. They may very well just want to throw women in jail for having miscarriages. No, they don't. Every single one of these laws allows for this type of treatment. Every single one of them. They know it and they're lying. And what a surprise. The lies are once again designed to increase their power and get them money. This is the case every single time. It's important that we keep calling it out so that people who might not follow this stuff every day don't fall for it. Because this is a lie, and it's a lie with really potentially dangerous side effects. If you have a miscarriage, you are in every state in the union are going to be absolutely within your legal right to remove the miscarriage. That is, in every state, without exception, don't, that's not something you need to worry about. What you should worry about, however, is a bunch of people in the media and on the left coming to you and trying to lie every single day to manipulate people, to manipulate mothers in difficult circumstances, to try to, for whatever reason, quench their thirst 
to make children's lives go away. It is a lie, and you need to know about it. You know, if you know anything about me, you know, I'm a, I'm a classy guy. Mm-hmm. Class all over the place. That's me. And, you know, if you have a, a, great, a great suit, right? a great watch, you have a great... I mean, there's certain things you need to have to be the James Bond type character that I am. Mm-hmm. And if you are not familiar with Vincero watches, well... You should be, because they have these great watches that are going to impress everybody around you. When you go to the nice party, you go to the nice dinner, you have your Vincero watch out. People are going to be looking at it. They're going to notice it. These are stylish watches, and they're at affordable prices. Watches can be super duper expensive. In fact, they can be like ex- as expensive as a car. They can be as expensive as a house. You don't need to spend that much money to have a high-quality, lasting timepiece that looks fantastic. If you're looking for the perfect gift, either to elevate your own style or that of someone you love, you can save 20% right now and get free shipping when you order the exclusive with my exclusive code STU. Now, Vincero designs everything in-house. They source their own materials and produce in small batches, which means they're committed to doing it right. Uh, you know, that's what they do. They're a lifestyle brand out of San Diego that also makes high-quality and affordable sunglasses, jewelry, and a whole lot more. Don't wait, uh, or it'll be too late. Get 20% off plus free shipping site-wide with the code STU at VinceroCollective.com. Support the show and check them out at V-I-N-C-E-R-O Collective.com. VinceroCollective.com. Code is STU. Look good, feel good, and save big with Vincero. I'm happy to welcome Matt Ridley back to the program. He's a biologist and the co-author of a great book, Viral, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19, which is available wherever you get your books. This is an incredibly important issue, and knowing the answer to this question is vital to uh, human civilization. I mean, it's really that uh, that clear. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks for having me on the program. It's great to be back with you. I appreciate it. Um, can you kind of bring us back to the beginning, the kind of the origin story of this book? Because I, I think a lot of people, uh, certainly back in you know early mid 2020, were thinking well, this needed this this whole lab leak theory needed to be disregarded by any serious person. Uh, and we've come quite a long way in the last couple of years. We have. I was one of those who was telling others that you can dismiss the lab leak theory. And I was basing that on what other scientists were telling me. They were saying, no, no, we've ruled it out. And I began to look into it. Uh, I discovered that it wasn't nothing like as clear cut as that. I came across the work of a brilliant young scientist, Alina Chan, uh, who had shown some important things about the virus. uh, And we then began to uncover, she and I together, uh, the most extraordinary stories about um, what wasn't wasn't being told to us about what was going on in Wuhan, how they hadn't been able to to connect it to a market. They hadn't been able to find infected animals in the market. Uh, and, you know, in the end of the day, this outbreak had happened of a coronavirus, a bat coronavirus outbreak had happened in the city with the biggest bat coronavirus research lab in the world. And the experiments they were doing there were extraordinarily risky. We know that for certain. What we haven't been able to establish for certain uh, is that this one came from one of their experiments, but it's uh, looking increasingly likely. And um, uh, there's been a huge fight back, not just from the Chinese authorities, but from Western scientists. And uh, yet now, I think particularly with the FBI coming out this week and the um, uh, the Department of Energy as well, I think we are now starting to see uh, more energy going into trying to find out exactly what happened. Yeah, I think it's certainly a positive, you know, that we hear from the Department of Energy who said this week they they think it's likely with low confidence, uh, which I don't don't know what that means exactly, but low confidence that they're going to, uh, that it would be a lab leak is what the cause of this was initially. I I am a little worried that we're kind of like looking to government agencies for in a sort of credentialism sort of way. And everyone's saying, well, this many agencies say this and this many agencies say that. That's not really how science is supposed to work, is it, Matt? Absolutely. And and one of the lessons of this debate has been that the establishment has been pretty hopeless, frankly. 
uh, yet, you know, as you say, uh, you know, you and I don't get convinced by a government agency saying they've come to a conclusion, but actually it does have a big impact on mainstream media. I think that's mm. the difference. Mm. Um, but, you know, one of the interesting things about this debate has been the role of talented amateurs in finding stuff out. Uh, there's a guy in India called the Seeker who found out some very crucial information early on. There's a Spaniard in, in Spain uh, called uh, Francisco Ribera who did an incredible job of piecing together exactly which caves these scientists had been to and which viruses they've got. There's a guy in, in New Zealand who works for himself who has found out extraordinary details of the very earliest cases in Wuhan. These are the heroes of this investigation, not the big scientific labs, not the big government agencies, not the spooks, um, and you know, uh, not even the mainstream journalists who've been, frankly, not very interested in this story. Yeah, it really is an incredible part of this, that how regular people sort of picked up the ball where everyone else decided to put it down and follow this, this string. You, you, you trace this really in exhaustive detail going back, and it is such an important story, um, to what, 2011, 2012, in a cave in, in China. Can you bring us back there and walk us through what we think the, or the, the series of events is that brings us to COVID-19? Yes, uh, we know when they first published the, the genome of this virus that's causing the pandemic, they said, uh, oh, and by the way, there's another virus that's very similar. It's called RATG13. They just changed the name of it, which was kind of annoying because it took us two months to work out that they'd got this other virus and brought it to Wuhan from a site um, a thousand miles or more away in southern Yunnan, where um, there was a an outbreak in 2012 of an unexplained pneumonia that killed three people and very nearly killed three others. Uh, and these guys had been working in a mine shaft. They thought, oh my God, this is the first time a SARS virus has jumped into human beings directly from bats. Uh, so they investigated big time. They sent several expeditions over, seven expeditions over um, three years to the site. They collected samples from bats and brought them back to Wuhan, even though it's a very long way away because that's where the main research lab was. Now, it turned out um, seven years later that the, that one of the viruses they brought back was the very closest relative uh, of SARS-CoV-2. It wasn't the one that actually caused the pandemic. It's not quite that close, uh, but it is so close that it suggests that they were working on a group of viruses in that lab that could have given rise to this pandemic. Do you think this is an example of sort of the early evidence coming out in a way that made us go down the wrong road, honestly? Or was there some level of uh, an effort to just hide this because people thought maybe their type of research and funding would be threatened, that maybe they had some um, some uh, some issues in responsibility for not maybe the exact release of the virus, but uh, this type of research that led to it? Why did we go down this road so passionately, so fast, and then have to turn around and realize, wait a minute, we might have been heading the wrong direction? Mm, yeah. Well, we have seen leaked emails that tell us a bit about what happened in those early days within the scientific community, in the US in particular, and also internationally. Uh, and on the 1st of February 2020, there was a crucial meeting between a number of senior virologists and other scientists in which they basically said, oh my God, this looks awfully like one of the ones they've been working on in that lab. Not only does it resemble it genetically, but it includes a feature that we've never seen before in one of these kinds of viruses, a thing called a furin cleavage site, which makes it more infectious. Um, and we know that in that lab, they've been putting furin cleavage sites into viruses as part of uh, various experiments. So maybe this thing leaked from a lab. They said that to each other privately. Mm. But as the result of that meeting, they came out of that, and within a week, they had drafted a paper saying, we can rule that out. And no new evidence had come forward to rule it out, but they had, I think, looked around and decided that uh, it would be damaging to international harmony. That's one of the phrases they used in their emails. Damaging to the reputation of science in general and science in China in particular. And I think there was a general decision here that it might it might encourage people who are anti-science to stop funding science, to stop 
supporting science. And to that, I would say it's far more dangerous for the reputation of science to uh, hope it'll go away and pretend it didn't happen than to own up. Because that's what's going to really damage the reputation of science is being found to to have um, misled the public. And there were two papers that came out at the end of February and in March 2020, um, which basically tried to kill the idea of a lab leak prematurely without any good evidence. Uh, and I think that was a really damaging thing to do. I'm very pro-science. I'm pro-vax. I'm pro-biotech. I'm uh, I, I, spent my career um, uh, saying that science is humanity's greatest achievement. Um, so I'm not here to bash science, but I am here to complain when people uh, take a political decision to um, uh, try and take the spotlight away from risky research that shouldn't have been going on. Right, because you can argue, I mean, there have been real arguments among scientists whether gain of function is a really good thing, right? I mean, this is not something, I mean, there's definitely been fears about it as well. But there's been arguments for years going on about this topic. Uh, I don't think people would have said, look, we blame the scientists, especially American scientists, for this behavior. It's the hiding of it. It's the covering the it's tracks. The I think that's exactly right. Uh, I think if they'd come out and said, look, we strongly suspect this might have come from a lab. We hope it didn't, but we badly want to find out. Let's investigate. Let's open our books about what we know in the West, because quite a lot of scientists in the West were in close collaboration with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And let's urge the Chinese uh, scientists to do the same. Uh, and, you know, if they can ex uh, convince us that it didn't come out of their lab, then all well and good. If they'd done that, I think science would have looked very good. But I think trying to shut down the possibility and then having to admit two or three years later uh, that actually we prematurely uh, ruled that out, that's really damaging. I think one of the things, too, that hit people initially was the idea of a lab leak kind of feels like something that would be in an action movie, right? It, does, it doesn't seem like... Uh, the normal way things have happened. But you you document in the book that th this has happened over and over again. There have been many lab, lab leaks, and this is very well might not be the last one we see. We are in danger if we don't tighten this process up to seeing uh, yet another one of these situations coming really at any time. Right. So uh, just to give you a, an example, uh, in 2002 three there was the SARS outbreak. Uh, we don't think that happened w because of a lab leak. But uh, when it was over... SARS was being studied in a number of labs around the world, and it infected people. It infected uh, researchers at least six or seven times, once in Taiwan, once in Singapore, and several times in Beijing. Um, and in most of those cases, they don't know how they got infected. They thought they were uh, uh, following all the right protocols and things like that. They didn't drop a flask or puncture a glove, but nonetheless, they got infected. So this does happen. I mean, in 2019, just before this pandemic began, there was an outbreak of brucellosis in Lanzhou in China caused by a lab leak. And, you know, there was no bones about it. Everybody knows that's what happened. They were able to find that that uh, out-of-date disinfectant had been used on a sample. And as a result, um, uh, dangerous bacteria had been leaked uh, into the environment and infected 10,000 people. So these things happen pretty well all the time, mostly not serious. Uh, but we have been playing Russian roulette if we've been doing really dangerous experiments at low biosafety levels in some labs in some parts of the world for no particularly good reason. I mean, the ostensible reason for the experiments they were doing in Wuhan was to predict and prevent the next pandemic. Well, they certainly didn't do that. <laughs> Very true. Uh, last one here for you, uh, for you, Matt. We, you know, one of the questions I think a lot of people land on here is this has been such a, 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 a visceral political issue here when it comes to this. And, and it seems, at least here in the United States, that the right has taken almost uh, ownership of the lab leak theory and the left has taken ownership of the natural theory, which, again, this is not how science is supposed to work at all. Um, I, I think one of the one of the questions that you get eventually after you go down this road and, and government agencies start to give this credibility is people on the left or in the mainstream media say, look, maybe this is plausible, but it's not important. Why, this is not an important thing. Finding the origins of this virus is not uh, something we should be spending a lot of time on. 
Can you push back against that? Because to me, it seems like it's absolutely vital for us to know the beginnings of this virus. I, I'm I'm really astonished when people make that argument to me, and I, I've heard it, as you say, quite often. Uh, that uh, look, come on, it doesn't matter. Stop rocking the boat. There's nothing we can do about it now. It happened. Uh, we're not going to learn anything from it. Would you have said that about Chernobyl? Would you have said that about the Challenger crash? Uh, you know, of course not. If there's a if there's a major accident and it kills people, we want to find out why, so that we so that it doesn't happen again. Whether an airliner crashes or something like that. Uh, you know, we 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 insist on knowing exactly what happened so that we can be sure to prevent it happening again. As it is, we've learned very little from this. We're not doing much to stop the trade in wildlife, which is the other possibility. We're not doing much to stop gain of function research in virology labs around the world. Um, so uh, we're, we're still playing Russian roulette. And we still don't have all the information that we need from China. They still have not been forthcoming at all. Uh, Matt Ridley, the, the book with Alina Chan is called Viral, The Search uh, for the Origin of COVID-19. It's a great, great book. And it's really, really in-depth. If you want to understand how all of this happened and look at all the real data and real track here to try to figure this out, uh, he goes through all of this and... and and it's something that both uh, both of you should be really proud of. It's a really important book, and I hope everyone goes out and picks it up. Matt, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me on the show. So Biden hasn't vetoed anything yet. You know that? I mean, I guess they've had control the first two years. Finally, the Republicans have the House, but it's hard to get anything even through uh, to Biden's desk that he wouldn't like because it's all Democrats, right? The Senate can always stop it. Well, the Senate could have stopped this ESG plan. There's an anti-ESG bill going through, but Biden looks like he's going to have to veto it because it passed the Senate 50 to 46. Now, um, you have uh, Manchin and uh, John Tester, uh, both Democrats in red states, of course, voting for this, and uh, that got it to uh, 50. Uh, then you have, of course, had Fetterman, who's, you know, doing whatever he's doing these days. A couple people weren't there. Um, but 50 to 46 was the vote. Now, this basically it is an, ES, an anti-ESG bill. Um, it is supposed to uh, hold back some of these uh, regulations that Biden has tried to push through. Uh, Biden looks like he will uh, um, veto that. There's another one he may not veto, which is pretty interesting, too. We'll maybe get into that uh, tomorrow. Biden says he's not confident the Supreme Court will clear student loan forgiveness plan. No way. You're kidding me. They're not going to take your completely unconstitutional bull crap and pass it? Why? I don't understand. Now, when I say pass it, of course, it was never a law, so it's never been passed. He just kind of said he wanted it one day, and the Supreme Court won't go along with him. Wow, what a bunch of jerks. Well, uh, yes, uh, that's what he thinks is going to happen. Maybe, this is just an idea for the future, consider whether it's constitutional before you do it. What do you think? It's, a, it's an idea. It's out there. It's a theory. Maybe try that next time and see what happens. Really, we're in this era of, of, of crazy leftist policies that have come too close to becoming reality. And now people are pushing back against them. Uh, there's a new California bill that uh, wants all gender neutral bathrooms to be available at public schools statewide. All gender neutral bathrooms. Um, the California districts will have until January 1st, 2025 to have a gender neutral bathroom on the campus should the bill become law. Now, of course, this has a high cost and everything else. I will say that I proposed a similar uh, measure, and it was uh, actually not a bill, not an executive order, but a constitutional amendment. And that constitutional amendment uh, asks very simply that in the United States of America, one man, one bathroom. Do we really need to be going tinkle next to other people? Is that really a thing still in the year 2023? Why? Why can't we just have, we all do it at home alone. Why do we go out and just with random people we don't know, hey, let's all do this together in the same room. Isn't this a good idea? Forget all the gender stuff. We should just be able to do this in the privacy of a small little room where nobody else can see. I know it's a weird idea, but again, I'm, I've got plenty of them today. Like for example, the California trans teacher with giant prosthetic breasts <laughs> who is now on leave after the parents slammed the school board. And it's like, well, think of this story for a second. 
a woman with, what was it, 96 double Q breasts? Now, of course, not a woman and did not have 96 double Q breasts. They were prosthetic and it was a guy. And the guy would come into uh, to school and wear these big fat breasts and teach children in them near saws, by the way, which is a whole nother layer of this story. And we were all supposed to say, wow, look at the inclusivity. This is really, this is a wonderful development. And it was so embarrassing, yet it kept going on in Canada and going on and on and on and on. And then they took a misstep. No, it wasn't wearing giant prosthetic breasts to teach children. The misstep was going home and then being caught not wearing them. Because when they found out he was just walking around town as a dude, that's when they suspended him. So not having the prosthetic breasts was actually the problem. I just want to make sure you follow that logic because that is progressive uh, North America here in the year 2023. Young men reveal why so many of them are single. They say dates feel more like job interviews. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine dating in this, in this environment? Holy crap. You say one thing that's even the slightest bit askew and your entire life is destroyed. Good God. I, I feel for any of you single people out there. Uh, and I got to say, like, I, you know, I was the type, I, I never had any game, you know, mm, not exactly a ladies man. And I will say, um, when you get down that road and it just feels like it's a waste of time, people are just going to be like, screw it, where's AI? Uh, can AI help me out here? That'll be, my, that'll be my girlfriend for the next 50 years. Uh, FIFA is being um, uh, called tone deaf for appointing a supermodel, Ad Adriana Lima, as its global am fan ambassador. <laughs> Which is interesting because, like, we keep saying, like, oh, we have to make sure there's a diversity. We have to make sure, um, you know, that women have important jobs, but not pretty women. That's tone deaf. Don't you dare allow an attractive woman to have a job. We want only ugly. Can we get the Canadian shop teacher with her 96 double Q prosthetic breasts to have that job? Then that's progress. See, this is good, though. It works together because... Uh, if you're going to have all the, the men afraid to go on dates, it's good that they're home when, when they're watching soccer, they can see Adriana Lima. And that, that Adriana turns into their pseudo-girlfriends. This is really making for a very healthy civilization. Okay, so here's what happened. Generally, generally uh, speaking, and this is just a, an overall position, not necessarily in every case, but generally speaking, people don't like to be murdered. Um, so when they think they're going to get murdered, they typically panic. And there was some panic in California when people saw this outside. Uh, it's a picture of what seems to be potentially either a ghost or maybe the guy from, you know, uh, some horror movie or whatever. And it looks like kind of the scream mask. People called the 911, uh, you know, the, the, the police and 911. And then this tweet came out from Sonoma, California. This morning, our dispatch center received multiple calls reserving, uh, regarding an individual standing at a street wearing a scream costume. This individual has been contacted and was hired by a company through Paramount to promote the new Scream movie. Thank you for everyone's concerns. Guys, you're gonna get yourself killed. And I guarantee the ninth Scream sequel is not the hill you literally want to die on.